so thank you for coming along to listen today. Um, my name's Tyson, I work for Fisheries Queensland and I'm from Cairns up there. And um, this is a topic that uh, I've recently started dipping my toe into. It's not a lot of hard data, it's more um, anecdotes about um, something that I'm very passionate about, which is being the link between fishing and science. Um, my nickname's actually Fish, well back in the day it was Fish Boy. So I've been very keen on fishing my whole life and now I'm very proud to be standing up here talking about how to make uh, good scientific decisions about recreational fishing. So the things I'm going to cover today are the uncertain future of off-site type surveys. Um, people don't want to be contacted and things like that. So um, they're starting to look like a, a method that um, we might need to uh, try and enhance, get get people wanting to um, provide their data. And then an obvious solution is to get fishers that want to talk to us about their, their fishing catches, that provide their lengths, um, submit their catch data, and then what we can learn from other behaviour change initiatives about this and how to apply it to recreational fishers. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we stand today um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So most fisheries management authorities over the last 20 to 30 years have used off-site diary style recreational fishing surveys where you uh, call people um, or send them text messages and basically ask if they've gone fishing or not. That gives you your estimate of participation. And then um, you follow their fishing behaviour for 12 months and you can uh, basically weight that up to match the population uh, to provide estimates of participation, catch and effort for commonly caught species over broad spatial scales. These have worked really well over broad spatial scales, commonly caught species. However, uh, as we learn more about different stocks of fish, we learn that there's a different genetic stock of barramundi in Rockhampton to the one that's up off Cairns. And um, we need data at increasingly finer spatial scales. Uh, and also uh, managing authorities are asking for that as well, as well as stakeholders. They want to know what's being caught in their local area. And those types of surveys, although um, Karina gave an excellent talk on how to bring them down at a smaller spatial scale yesterday, um, you do need a lot of replication to do that with precision at smaller spatial scales. And because people don't want to be contacted um, via unsolicited phone calls, unsolicited text messages, unsolicited emails, it's getting really hard to get um, good participation in those types of surveys. So it's becoming difficult to contact people and that means it's expensive. So um, something that we're about to start working on in Queensland uh, is a pilot study that I'll be leading about moving towards measuring uh, fishing effort on site. So things like cameras at boat ramps, which has been done before, but typically has a lot of man hours associated, man or woman hours associated with counting the trailers off the video footage, but we've now got um, machine learning that can do those types of things for us. So we can get fishing effort like that. We can then uh, estimate the proportion of total fishing effort that we're covering at ramps that have cameras versus ramps that don't have cameras using satellite imagery, so counting trailers off satellite images. And then uh, combining that with catch rates that can come from things like creel surveys, in Queensland, we're very lucky to have a boat ramp survey program that expands over 50, spans over 50 ramps. Um, and basically, you can adjust for non-fishing boats from these creel surveys. You can also get catch rates, how many fish people are catching of each species per trip. So that's a small study that we're starting to look into as to how we can improve the spatial resolution of our harvest estimates. And other groups are doing all sorts of wonderful things, like the VFA have got mandatory catch reporting for some species. Uh, you've got voluntary catch reporting logs in WA, South Australia, Tasmania, and people are doing awesome work on trying to work out how to uh, expand those voluntary catch reported numbers up to estimates of total harvest using non-probability-based statistics. Um, and some groups have even gone back towards mail-based surveys because they're less likely to be perceived as a scam than a phone call or a text message or anything like that. So what I'm about to uh, get at here is that no matter which of these types of solutions we pick as to how we try and get our recreational data, I would all argue that they all rely on the goodwill of fishers to want to tell us about what they're catching, do the right thing, contribute your data. If we don't know what people are catching, 
how are we going to be able to manage the fishery well? Some people may say, oh, we'll just make it mandatory, mandatory catch reporting. But uh, in Queensland, at least, we don't have the enforcement capability to go out and tell heaps of fishers off for, doing, for not reporting their catch. We need, we have the capability to go and catch people, the small number of people who are doing the wrong thing, taking undersized fish, things like that. But if we've got an, an army of recreational fishers who do not want to tell us about what they're catching, we're never going to be able to enforce it. So no matter what solution you pick, we really need them to have the goodwill to try and um, basically uh, tell us about their data. So I've been thinking about this a little bit and what key traits we need uh, as part of the recreational fishing community uh, to basically uh, make them want to report their catch and, and submit their data. And we think that um, a sense of stewardship for the fishery where you realise that your individual actions have an impact. Yes, you're only one person, but there are a lot of recreational fishers out there. So for each additional fish that you keep or each additional thing that you do, you do have a big impact as a collective group. Uh, acceptance that sustainable management may result in changes to harvest. If you lined 100 people up and said, do you want to sustainably manage fishery? They would all say yes. And then you say, well, what actions are you willing to take to ensure that if we know that there's a problem? That's when it starts to, be, um, to break down, where they go, oh, but I don't want to change my bag limit or change what, I, what my dad did, which is different to what... Um, yeah, the, the, when the um, issue starts to affect them personally, that's when things can break down. And that comes from a trusting relationship with a management agency. And, um, like, I'm from Queensland and we've had a lot of... Um, sort of backlash around Spanish mackerel and things like that recently, and I know other states have dealt with similar things around snapper, jewfish in WA. Uh, we need to build up that trust with the management agency that, so that when we think that there's a problem, people are willing to help us fix that problem by providing that data. And I would argue that all of this relates to the attitude of recreational fishers. I started to do a little bit of research into how to change behaviour and a key driver of behaviour is attitude. So uh, you can make something nice and easy for people to do and they can say, yep, I would do that. But unless they actually really think that there's a problem there and their attitude believes that they're trying to help solve something or there's a benefit in it for them, um, they're not going to do it. And a key driver of behaviour is attitude. So how do we change attitude? There's a few different ways that we can approach that. Uh, the first is through education, and I was fortunate enough to meet Lottie um, yesterday, who, this, um, who led this research. She's here at the conference. I'm not sure if she's here in the room. If you are, put your hand up. Hello, Lottie. I hope I got that right. Um, so support for mandatory catch reporting um, increased with environmental attitude and awareness. So if we provide more education, people um, seem to be more on board with providing their data. We see that in our boat ramp survey program all the time, where people are initially um, a little bit hesitant to provide their data and you explain the way in which it's used and they come on board. I have a really um, good, well, I think it's a good personal example of this. So um, a lot of the people in this room are probably fisheries scientists and managers, and when you're at a barbecue and you tell people that you work for fisheries, sometimes you might get that response, ah, you're working for the enemy almost, uh, from really keen fishers. And so I do a lot of spear fishing in my spare time, and um, back when I was uh, doing my uh, PhD on green zone design, so protected areas, I'd quite often find myself in a car at four o'clock in the morning with some spear fishers, who I'd never met, we were all going out diving for the day, and they'd ask me what I do for work. And I'd say, I work on the design of marine parks and green zones. And they'd go, oh, we're going out in the boat with this fella. <laughs> and um, I, I had a, um, I'd spend the rest of the day sort of talking to them about the science that goes on behind um, some of the things, ask them what their favourite species of fish to catch were. Um, and maybe it's, um, in some examples, they were liked it spearfishing mangrove jack on a reef that was really close to a headland and a mangrove system nearby. And we know that mangrove jack, they grow up on mangroves, they move out to rocky headlands and then out to reefs. And one of these reefs was um, a really well-placed spot for that particular species. And the mangroves and the headland nearby were actually part of a green zone. And I'd explain that 
maybe that's what's actually helping that to be a really good spot for those species that you like catching. And I'm proud to say that some of those people who initially regarded me with the utmost suspicion um, are actually really good mates now. They call me and ask what I'm doing for work and um, I try and I use them as a test group to explain whatever fishery science concepts that we're working on at the moment. So that's another example of how education can try and change attitudes of people. Um, so our director, Sam, he gave a really good example yesterday of providing a positive alternative um, where his talk on switch your fish. So instead of targeting um, snapper and pearl perch off Queensland, um, provided basically recipes and incentives and ways to catch other species like mahi-mahi. And that was part of the FAD program where we installed a whole heap of FADs offshore. I know that um, New South Wales and other states have been doing that for quite a while, but that's a, a good example of a positive um, way that you can try and shift behaviour. Uh, same dish, new fish, that was another one in South Australia. And even things like Kids Alive Do the Five. I'm not sure if you remember those um, jingles, but basically trying to prevent um, kids drowning in pools using sort of positive messaging about the things that you need to do to stop that happening. Then we've got um, negative messaging. So that's another way you can change attitudes and behaviour. Um, I was interested to listen to Sasha and Andy's talks um, yesterday about you have to be careful with your messaging. You can't jump up on an ivory tower and say, don't do this, don't do that. You've got to try and propose um, ways forward together. So maybe negative messaging is not a good idea here, but it's definitely been used quite a bit in the past to try and um, change people's behaviour, where you've got cigarette packets that have got graphic messages on the back, do the right thing, litter campaign, which is all based off social judgement, um, of doing the right, um, people not littering, and things like speeding, where even though it's legislated against, they were sort of trying to imply that hooning and accelerating heavily away from traffic lights is pointless and you're not very well endowed downstairs if you're doing that type of behaviour. So there's lots of different ways that we can try and change behaviour. Um, but how do we apply that to recreational fishes so that we can make things like catch reporting a new social norm? Now I'm not an expert on this field, but these are the things that I think are the most Im that I think are going to be important in the way that we address this. The first is to understand the underlying attitudes of fishers. So why are they going fishing? Is it because they're fishing for food? Are they catch orientated? Or are they going fishing for mental health reasons? Uh, what their attitudes towards data sharing are? towards fisheries science. If we know where the barriers are, where they don't trust us or where they don't want to share their data, they're happy to contribute but they don't want their spots shared and things like that. If we understand that a little bit better, we can tailor our messaging around the next part um, to be as accurate as possible. So the next part is sensitising fishers to our data needs and why not sharing, sharing data is going to be a problem in the long run. The problem is unless you participate in our surveys or contribute your data for mandatory surveys or contribute the, your data for voluntary surveys, we don't know how many fish recreational fishers are taking. So I think that's, gonna, um, that's kind of the key message we need to get, keep getting out there. And then um, this relates back to the, the type of um, positive messaging that we can then put out about education. So the next step would be to educate fishers on how they can help us solve the problem. Not stand up in the ivory tower and say, don't do this, don't do that. We need to say, hey, how do you want to help us fix this? Like, is it through a voluntary catch reporting app? Is it through apps um, like that log your own? Yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways to do this. Is that 13 minutes or 15? Two, you've got two to go. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> So yeah, sharing your data and participating in our surveys, but coming at it from a place where we're trying to get better together. Um, so, um, sorry, um, this is my last slide. Um, one thing I'd like to reiterate is this is stuff that's not based off a lot of hard research. This is me sitting in, um, uh, where I'm on the left hand side there I've got a little bit more hair but I'm hoping that the fishers and um, everybody in the community can help us get from um, from what what I see to be um, a better well, I'd like to get to a better way to do things where people are really invested in I promise I'm not touching anything <laughs> I'm not doing this for effect 
Um, but that's pretty much my last slide. What I'd like to say is that if there's anyone here who's found this interesting, works on behaviour change, um, is a leader in recreational fishing who can influence large groups of people and has ideas on how that we can try and improve this, um, the, the attitude of fishers to contribute to, that, um, to our fishery science, I'd love to talk to you about it. So thank you very much for listening. And we'll move right along because uh, time is short and we have to get this thing cleared. It's not, it's not intuitive, is it? <laughs> This seems a bit clunky, we're doing something wrong or something wrong. Okay. Is that, that, that's the strategy? Yeah, so which... which John? Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I've walked into this fresh because I'm the streaming guy, but I'm definitely going to help you get there. Sean, click on Sean. We should go forward. Yep. Okay. I'm clicking it. There we go. It wasn't working before. Just the one, but I did notice the hand went from the hand to the pointer and then it, and when it went to the hand it worked. So interesting. It is glitchy and it happens occasionally. Maybe, maybe just because of the load. Thanks, thanks. No worries. It's, it's all well that it's yeah. All right. Um, I know, I know I'm I'll go ahead and get started. I, I'm scared to touch anything, so uh, uh, bear with me for a sec here. Um, I'm Sean Morton. I'm with the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, in the U.S., um, uh, uh, commonly called NOAA. If you bear with me, that, that's the only acronym or initialism I'll try and use today. Um, I'm with NOAA. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, our update of the National Saltwater Recreational Fisheries uh, Policy. If folks were in this room yesterday, they heard uh, Russ Dunn's uh, talk about kind of the the larger uh, United States fishery management uh, scene and, and, uh, and how that framework works. Uh, and he mentioned this policy, which kind of is the, the baseline for, for what our recreational fisheries uh, team. It's, it's our initiative. And um, so I'm going to be talking about that, that policy. Uh, in, in terms of terminology, think of it like uh, sort of a very high-level strategic plan. Um, it, it's about, it's fairly simple, but about six pages, but uh, this policy is sort of our guidance document for how we work in, in the recreational fishing world. Uh, and uh, go forward one. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the policy and that, that sort of plan and framework itself. Um, we're in, we're smack dab in the middle of updating this policy. I'm gonna, um, we're, we're about six months in through taking public comment. Um, we're preparing uh, that update uh, now, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and with, uh, with that comment period, we've, we've been out taking public comment for a good four months uh, uh, leading up to this meeting you know, here. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what we heard. It's going to follow along uh, very well with what Tyson just described. Uh, data, data was a big issue. And then I'll talk about next steps and, and how we develop implementation plans uh, and how people can participate. And we do have sort of an international component to that, but, but it's, it's our national policy and, and how we do science and uh, communication uh, management and engagement. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, just at the, at the very highest level, uh, the policy statement itself is uh, it, it's the policy of NOAA to foster, support, and enhance a, a broadly accessible and diverse array of sustainable saltwater recreational fisheries for the benefit of the nation. Um, this, this, this extreme high level 
uh, it kind of kickoff statement for the policy and, and sort of our planning uh, that's been around since 2015. Uh, when we went out for public comment, uh, we, we got a lot of comments. One interesting kind of uh, note that we got was no one, no one said this, this should change. Um, everyone actually really just liked, you know, that, that starting statement, kind of just what Tyson was saying. Everyone can kind of get behind this part. Um, uh, um, it's when you get into the nitty gritty that people start to have some significant comments. Um, the purpose uh, of, this, of this plan, why it was developed, um, it's a guidance document, and it's guidance for NOAA to develop and maintain sustainable saltwater recreational fisheries. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's what we lead with. Uh, it identifies our, our goals uh, and guiding principles uh, for planning and budgeting. I mean, most important, you know, how we make decisions about priorities in those programs, how we fund, how and what, and, and what programs we do fund, uh, where we're going to spend uh, limited resources on communication and engagement and get that kind of most bang uh, for the buck. Uh, it also uh, get, gets in and provides guidance and suggested examples uh, of programs and, and projects, uh, implementation concepts uh, for, uh, for our different uh, components, uh, both regional and national, uh, of, of our rec fish initiatives um, on, you know, what we would support as an agency. And, and it's important to lay out some of these examples for a three to four year plan um, so that people know what to bring forward uh, as it goes through this agency process, what we're going to support. Um, so it's, it's important to define those strategies. Um, uh, pretty straightforward goals in our existing one, uh, in our existing uh, program, support and maintain sustainable saltwater uh, recreational fisheries, promote saltwater recreational fisheries for the benefit of the nation, and uh, enable enduring participation in and enjoyment uh, of saltwater recreational fisheries. So, through science-based conservation management. Again, high-level goals uh, that everyone really can get behind. Uh, if, again, I'll refer to Russ Dunn's presentation yesterday. The one thing we, you know, a couple things that, that weren't in here from 2015 that, that everyone really recognized that we needed to start looking at was climate change. And uh, when we went out for public comment and um, we even, you know, it, you know, it, was, it was fairly universal that uh, we need to start looking at climate resilient recreational fisheries. And there's a lot of more science, more engagement, more communication uh, about the changes that we're seeing out there that needed to be included as a, as a high level goal. Uh, we also needed to really start looking at um, diversity and equity in recreational fisheries. You know, when you're putting that money forward for certain programs, policies, actions, projects, Look at those underserved communities, um, the, the folks we've traditionally not been working with. Make sure that that's a high-level goal. So without, you know, while it's still under review, we're, we're pretty sure those are going to be two more uh, high-level goals that we'll be adding into the, into the, uh, uh, into the policy itself. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about that directed guidance. Um, this is our strategic plan that basically, you know, tells folks we want projects and programs to support ecosystem conservation and enhancement, promote public access. Uh, we want to look for more uh, innovative solutions to some of the challenges we've been seeing. Um, outreach and, and, and getting the science that we have uh, out there, the sound and trusted um, science that we have out there. I mean, I think Sasha's talk from yesterday in the keynote talked about there's there's a lot of information out there, but um, we you know we really want to be those ones to get that sound and trusted information out to the public for decision making um, and, and you know, how we communicate and who we communicate in terms of priorities for, for engagement. Um, who does this, the policy and, and this, the, uh, apply to, the strategic plan? Um, th this has come up uh, continually, uh, you know, that while we have a legal definition of recreational fishing as sport, uh, fishing for sport and pleasure, we are we, this policy and, and planning exercise. It definitely applies broader than that. It is non-commercial. We, we want it to be non-commercial fishing, very inclusive, uh, looking at beyond just sport and pleasure, but uh, the businesses and, and uh, that support uh, recreational fishing, uh, the four hire fleets, charters, things like that, uh, and the tournaments, and and really wanting to make sure that. Uh, if you're engaged in things like uh, sustenance fishing or 
uh, uh, subsistence fishing that you feel included uh, in, in this policy. So again, that's another part of this update that we're looking at. Um, like I said, we're, we're in the middle of this update. Uh, we had an open comment period starting in August, uh, went through the end of the calendar year. Um, 150 days is a really long time for a comment period, but we wanted to capture as much as possible. We, uh, our, our rec fish team, we've got about 10 people here at this conference, but uh, about 20, 22 people uh, all engaged uh, around the country, you know, throughout the United States and in coastal areas, meeting with our fishery management councils, our uh, uh, NGOs, um, state and local governments, regional governments, uh, to gather that input. Um, we hosted online webinars. We had an online portal uh, open. We had a dedicated email uh, inbox that anybody could provide those comments. Um, if you're going fishing, you might as well use bait. We, our, um, the head of NOAA Fisheries, we, we trotted her out for several meetings, uh, uh, the, the most high level person we could possibly get and, and got her engaged on this issue. She got to hear directly from fishermen and NGOs and groups um, and that worked really well. Um, it also made sure it was, it was on her mind that this is important. She definitely got, a, got an earful as, as we went around and did these uh, comments. You know, we, we got a great response, we had about 480 uh, individual responses just through the online activity. Um, we had about 50, there were more than 50 organizations write us letters and about 150 comments, you know, in, very individual, very personal that we, we did in one-on-one -on -one meetings or group meetings uh, or those, those online webinars. So really good response. We didn't get flooded with any kind of like mass postcard kind of uh, comment period, which is good. Um, we, we really liked the, the comments that we got. The questions and prompts that we use to, to kind of uh, focus those, those, those questions we got. We asked about the scope of the policy, um, how goals should be amended or, or added to, um, how do we better guide agency objectives as it relates to recreational fishing? Um, are there things, new concepts that we missed in, back in 2015 or have evolved into something that is a priority? Climate change being an obvious one. Underserved communities is another one. Um, and then we, we oh, other suggestions that they had for us. And, and that's what, you know, we certainly got the, the whole gamut, you know, fix my local pier, you know, my boat ramp's too crowded. I mean, we got all that stuff. Not really a national concern, but, but we definitely listened. Um, we heard about challenges and concerns with climate, balancing ocean uses, um, and, you know, a crowded ocean with new wind energy proposals, offshore aquaculture, new marine protected areas that may uh, uh, restrict access. A lot of comments, I think, uh, you know, every meeting we had, we had concerns about data collection, wanting more data, uh, getting the data back out to people, that how, how we report it, a lot of suggestions for different methodologies. We certainly heard about equity, environmental justice, making sure that, you know, we, we are being equitable in our programs and serving those underserved uh, communities that, that don't often, that often get missed in recreational fishing. Uh, increased effort and, and efficiency. Uh, that was another one, uh, you know, we heard this morning, uh, effort creep, I really like that term. We, we heard a lot about that, the bigger boats, uh, better electronics, um, it, you know, and, and both recognizing that in management, but, you know, what do you do about it? You can't turn off GPS. Everyone would go crazy if we did that. So. Um, you know, th those are all things to look for. Um, overall, you know, I come from a regulatory background, uh, 20 years of getting beat up over, over rulemaking. This was a very positive experience. People really wanted to um, uh, provide their input. They really liked what we wanted, what, what we were doing. Um, they just wanted more of it. So it was a lot of increased uh, re requests for increased effort, more data collection, get better data, get it back out to the people so they can make decisions more engagement, more collaborative research. Use the anglers that are out there to help with your research um, and use that in management. Um, we like the goals, we like the policies, we just want it, it you know, implemented more, you know, so fund this kind of stuff. More flexibility, we heard a lot about that. Uh, thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, the non-commercial part, I already kind of addressed that, but making sure that you know, this policy that we had, the strategic plan, really applies to uh, 
to everybody under, uh, you know, that, that could consider themselves recreational fishermen, not just, you know, you're there for sport and pleasure, but uh, anyone outside of that, that commercial activity. Um, and then we certain, you know, like I said, we, you know, everyone's got their favorite fish. We heard about it. So, um, so our next steps, just kind of what, what we're doing next, we're, we're updating this thing. We, you know, we're NOAA's a big agency. We've got about three months of, uh, you know, review and, and kind of iterative review through up through our leadership before we get this rolled out. We're developing those implementation, those action plans. I encourage folks to go online. Um, how do we implement this? I mean, what are those specific programs and projects that we are proposing for the next three years? That's in development right now. We hope to roll this out by September. Um, and, uh, and then with the start of our fiscal year, uh, uh, start, start funding these programs. So um, if there's more information, there's, there's our website, easy to find us. We also have a team email, recreational.fisheries.noaa.gov. You email that, a bunch of us get it. Um, we'll, we'll get questions answered. We'll still take suggestions. Those implementation items, I'll just put a plug for Tim Sartwell who's in the back. Um, he's going to be talking about how we implement at the, at the action project level uh, this afternoon. Uh, Tim, uh, 250 in this room. So I'll put in a plug for Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. That was a great talk. And um, Sean has a really big brief, but it doesn't include UFOs. So no, no conversations about UFOs. David? Next. Few more to say, didn't we? Uh, this is you. There you go. Cool, all right, I'll get started. Um, so today I'm going to be taking you through um, the story of a citizen science project that we started in Tasmania uh, called the Tassie Fish Frame Collection Program um, and some of the outcomes we were able to achieve. Um, so I work at Fisheries Tasmania, so part of the department down there. But just to be clear, I'm probably straddling a couple of roles in this. Um, I was part of IMAS before that, so the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies. Um, and in 2019, we started this project, so that's when I was there. Just a little bit about Tassie. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Australia, we are right down the bottom, so south of Victoria, smallest state uh, in Australia, um, and obviously um, probably a lot more cold water as well, as you can see there. Um, but we've got a changing environment uh, and some evolving pressures on fishing. We've got diverse and dynamic fish habitats, so you can, um, you can fish in these uh, oceanic high energy waters, you can be uh, trolling for big fish like tuna, you can go 400, 400 or 500 metres deep water um, off the shelf there, catch things like blue-white trevala, through to beautiful windshore and estuary waters as well, catching some of those smaller species. Um, but unfortunately, there's a few other changes we're seeing. So um, this part of Australia, and particularly for Tasmania, we're a global hotspot for uh, marine climate change. And associated particularly with that uh, has been some significant habitat loss. So things like giant kelp forests are really disappearing. And we've got this evolving fishing pressure too. So it seemed like through COVID, everyone realised Tasmania existed through a, um, a boat and a caravan came down to Tassie um, for a big holiday. So people are actually starting to move down here more. And we also heard this morning about that, um, that effort creep um, and that evolving fishing technology. But we've got some really amazing uh, recreational fish species to target. And for me, I like to think them in, in three categories. So you've got these cold water species, um, really iconic species there, striped trumpeter, uh, you've also got these resident fish species that are more or less at their thermal limit. So I've got a picture of a snapper there, uh, really well uh, known from pretty much the whole uh, southern half of the mainland of Australia. But they're pretty much on their limit in terms of their ability to live in cold water and, and breed and thrive um, in Tasmania. And then you've also got these seasonal warm water species. So we've got kingfish there, even through to on really particularly warm years, uh, we get things like striped marlin occasionally showing up. And that's a lot to do with that warm water. So that East Australian current runs down right, right from up in Queensland, right down uh, the eastern seaboard and gets to us in Tassie. 
And those two uh, last two categories, we'd like to uh, refer to them as emerging species in Tasmania. Um, we're seeing as, as um, and that habitat changes, water changes, um, potentially we're going to see them um, being more abundant and more of a fishy gro fishery growing for them. So associated with all those things, we've got some management challenges. We need to collect uh, annual data for some of our key species. And for those um, emerging species, a lot of the time we haven't had really solid Tasmanian specific data. Um, and we really need that to manage these, these fish well. So we saw an opportunity um, to really collaborate with uh, the, the fishing community through citizen science and to really be able to complement uh, the data and the knowledge that was being collected by IMAF. So that's where we started. Um, obviously got some snapper frames there and I just wanted to clarify what, what a frame is. So we're talking about from a science perspective, uh, we've got the whole fish from um, the head through to the tail all intact and ideally we want to have the organs also attached um, to the animals. So um, as it worked out, look, we, we'd take, absolutely take those frames if there was no <coughs> organs, but it's a point of clarification in terms of your communication. That little nuance of keep those organs in, we can use that and tell so much more about each fish species. Oh, each specimen actually. Um, and just a quick uh, flag there, uh, citizen science is certainly part moving forward in the uh, Tasmanian recreational uh, sea fishing strategy too. So let's have a look at a typical frame. I've got a beautiful King George whiting there, but what can we tell from it? So uh, we get it in the lab. Uh, IMAS science scientists will do all these measurements on it. So we start with uh, different length measurements. Um, each fish, we take the otoliths or the ear bones out. We obviously use that for ageing. Um, picture on the left there, that microscopic image is basically, you can see the, the annual rings that are formed uh, on that otolith. That's the oldest fish, the oldest King George whiting we uh, caught, or was actually um, analysed, and that was about 19 years old. Um, outside the scope of the work we were doing, but microchemistry is another avenue for looking at otoliths. Gives you some really amazing detail on uh, where fish have been through their lifetime. And then really key to have a look at those reproductive organs. Is, the female, is it a fish that's female, male? Is it uh, mature, immature? And what sort of uh, stage it is for reproducing? And those three areas, so your size, your age, and your reproduction, they're really the th three key pillars for any fisheries management uh, information. We also added a few things for different species. So particularly for those range extending species, um, we had a look at what they were eating, so we could have a look at those relationships with prey species and then ask questions about, okay, if there's an assumption that they're going to be rise in abundance, are they going to impact um, particular, potentially a, a competitive species or a prey species? And then genetics as well, so a couple of angles to that. Um, we'd really love to know a bit more about the connectivity of Tasmanian species with mainland species, sorry, yeah, species. Um, but within a species in Tasmania, are there subpopulations we need to know about? So for King George Whiting, it might be that we've got a northern subpopulation that might be quite distinct to the eastern uh, population. So we really need to know that too. And these are the target species that we came up with. So they're all um, recreational fish species uh, into these categories here. So the range extenders, kingfish snapper and King George Whiting. Um, some declining uh, key species for Tasmania as well. So we've got the sand flathead uh, and striped chumpeter. And also, um, this was more of an opportunistic one. Um, New South Wales were doing some work uh, nationwide on genetics of silver trevally. So again, an opportunity for um, get some Tasmanian samples and see that stock structure across a national level. Um, just to take you through some of the um, work we did in establishing an engagement network that underpinned this work. <coughs> Uh, so we established uh, up to about 19 uh, different drop-off points for frames, so fishers could catch a fish, um, bag it up, label it up and drop it off, and these were mainly tackle stores. Just a, a mark there, um, but basically that whole western half of Tasmania is uh, yeah, very sparsely populated, so that's the reason why we don't have many drop-off points over there. Um, the islands are somewhere they're also working on to try to establish those, so they're north, in the north, east and northwest. And um, then we started working with the fishing community. Uh, we launched uh, the program on social media. Facebook uh, ended up being a real hub uh, for engagement in this space. 
Um, got out to boat ramps and jetties, started talking to people, um, getting them involved. And we got a, a, a whole lot of people involved. So we've got recreational fishers, but also uh, charter operators and uh, some of the commercial fishers and processors as well. So had this data coming in, which was really good. Once that happened, we had a really good avenue then to go back out, talk to angling groups, share and explore a bit of that science and have you know our scientists there um, talking to rec fishers and really having that dialogue, which was great. And then just to put it all together, um, so we've got our target species, promoted and engaged, fishers went out and caught target species, um, saved those frames, dropped them off. We got our researchers involved. So to date, we've had over 1,600 frames and over 90 participants. Uh, we really were keen to give that information back um, to the people that were involved and, and participated. So each angler would get a uh, personalised data report, which then hopefully encourages them to uh, keep providing frames and also tell their own networks. That data really is critical um, to, to understanding these species, like I said. So we can then feed that back to the wider community. But critically, um, and this is one of the major purposes of it, is to really improve the sustainability of our, our fisheries management in Tasmania going forward. So a few outcomes. Firstly, looking at what the community um, could get out of this, and we really saw uh, marine literacy, um, an opportunity there to bump things up. So um, a lot of this, again, was through Facebook that we engaged and promoted some of the information. This is a basic picture showing the difference between a male and a female snapper, what to look for. So a lot of people catch fish. It doesn't matter if it's a snapper or not, but it's basic information. If you're catching a fish, rather than mindlessly gutting a fish, filleting it, next frame, let's go, just take a sec, have a look. Uh, you might be surprised that you might get uh, not just an even spread of males and females, but uh, it could be skewed one way or the other. So from that basic information, we started working with anglers and really upskilling them. So this is Glenn Saltmarsh, um, amazing guy, really great contributor, uh, really knows his snapper as well. So we got him to the point of actually being able to catch fish and identify that this was a female in, in very... Um, in a condition where spawning was absolutely imminent. So the blow up image there is a microscope image of the eggs, those clear eggs are what we call hydrated eggs. Um, so that fish was likely to be spawning that night um, or the next day potentially. So this was key information for Tasmania because we had very limited evidence of um, spawning activity for some of these species. And then it was really interesting to see once you give the data back, um, those questions that would come from it. So. Uh, sand flathead was an example here. Well, virtually, well, I think it was over 95% of these fish for this um, particular fisher were female, so very few males. And so that then feeds back to that natural curiosity of anyone that's fished and been in that, that um, environment. Uh, so we're able to answer some of those questions, provide um, a bit more of that background from a science perspective. But I also wonder if you go that step further, is that going to also give you an avenue to increase stewardship? Um, if it's that sort of light bulb, light bulb moment. If you're gutting fish, say you've got 20 sand flathead and 19 of those are female, you might have that understanding that, okay, this fishing pressure, my own fishing pressure, actually is potentially um, impacting this species. Um, we had some really cool two-way um, opportunities. So I love this one. This was... Uh, Dr. James Addy from IMAS actually went out to um, one of our absolute uh, best contributors. So this is Damon Sheriff, who's the absolute guru of uh, snapper fishing in Tasmania. Got out to his place and actually his frames were fresh, ready to go. Um, and James was actually doing dissections in front of him. Um, Damon loved it, happy to promote it on social media. So really good learning opportunity two way. And, and Damon's been great with providing some of that historical knowledge of, of snapper fishing in Tassie too. And then there was this also kind of, um, I guess, joint problem solving. So again, uh, looking at King George Whiting, some of those knowledge gaps we had around um, what are the adults doing, when are they spawning, where are they spawning through to, where are those uh, juveniles settling? It was like a paired approach. So, um, you know, an angler here caught this fish in 47 metre deep water. Most of our samples have been from 10 metres or less. So this was a bit of an anomaly, but also opens the opportunity up to think about, okay, that's probably based on, say, South Australian work. We know they breed in deep water. Um, that's potentially a breeding fish. What area was it in through to 
you know, our IMS staff getting out there and actually looking at some of the juvenile habitat. And this was a really, um, really breakthrough moment, that middle picture of actually um, finding these young of the year fish uh, in Tasmanian waters. Um, a bit about the science and management outcomes. Um, look, a lot of, lot of science-y type data here, um, but it's critical information that we really didn't have before uh, for Tasmania. So a couple of key things, things like le length and age of maturity are really critical to manage a species well. Uh, it can help you set things like size limits, um, potentially like your, your time of spawning, you know, you're protecting, protecting those breeding stock. Um, things like the diet, so this, this is a blow up of uh, the diet, this was created by Barrett Wolf, who's actually doing a swordfish talk next door. Um, but it's really cool information, you're looking at, um, from a science perspective, you're looking at the ecology of the species, what species is it relating to, and from a fishing perspective, it's, it's great to open that conversation up with anglers, because um, that really re relates to habitat use, you know, your bait and your lure selection as well. Um, quick one here if you want to do more reading. It's a big document, but it's pretty amazing. So we cover kingfish, uh, King George Whiting and Snapper, and it's really, um, I guess, assembling all that data we've been able to collect on those range-extending species for Tasmania. And a few take-homes for citizen science work um, that I've found. So finding that fishing angle and really fostering that curiosity and, and giving it an avenue to actually connect with the science. So um, in a lot of the, the Facebook work I did, you know, it, it's as simple as putting that lure in there. So kingfish, everyone in Tasmania, yes, we catch small fish on average compared to the rest of the nation, but everyone's frothing about kingfish at the moment. So big season. The two questions, if you put a Facebook picture up, oh, where we, where'd you catch it and what lures did you use? So it's just that little bit there where you're joining the fishing with the science. Um, oh, really oppor great opportunity to make real connection and maintain that connection with anglers. Uh, and I found that it was interesting. Some people loved it face to face, but equally some people just wanted to keep doing Facebook messages and you know, it was actually servicing that relationship. Um, we were able to identify some really key anglers uh, in that fishing community. Uh, so yeah, back on that, certainly identify those early, um, get them on board, but it, it wasn't a hard sell. Um, there was a real appetite for these guys to go, hey, this is really worth my being, me putting my name to. Um, network widely, um, have you, your finger on the pulse of what's happening anywhere. Ready to pounce, my, it's not a regret, but it would have been a nice to have. Uh, we had a genuine 80 centimetre King George Whiting caught in Tasmania. That is an enormous, enormous fish. Just missed out on the frame, which, yes. It's a, yeah, no, I saw a picture of it on a um, uh, measuring map. So, yeah, yeah, it would have been really nice to have. Uh, and that knowledge goes way beyond just the fish frames. These guys have got this intimate knowledge, particularly of their local area, where juveniles are coming up and um, that historic knowledge. So, thanks very much. And I'd really like to thank everyone that contributed to amazing guys. So, thank you. That was terrific, David. Thank you very much. And an 80 centimetre King George Whiting is something to behold. You sure it wasn't a kingfish? No. Um, also, I lived in Tasmania. If anyone one, one wants to eat the best fish in the world, it's a stripy trumpeter. Magnificent. Rod, can we have you up here? Another Tasmanian. Right, how do we do this? Um, yeah. Yep. Click magic. Right. Um, firstly, thanks to all the um, previous speakers. Terrific talks, uh, and some of it. Um, uh, if I knew that they were talking about some things, I could have probably cut my uh, talk down. So you know, it just shows their commonalities in talks. So um, yeah, I'm Rod Pern. I head up uh, a fantastic team, um, recreational sea fishing team in Tassie. Um, we do things a little bit different in Tassie than some people. We have got a separate department running. Uh, well, within the department, we actually manage uh, sea fishing. Um, inland fisheries uh, is done by our inland um, inland fishery service, which is a couple of people here in this room. So welcome them. Uh, my talk's about reconceptualising uh, recreational fisheries management uh, and attending the needs of changing fishery uh, through strategic planning. Um, excuse me for a minute, I'll just... I think that's... 
Uh, in particular, uh, I want to talk about the Tasmania sea fishing strategy. Uh, it's actually got some commonalities actually with the US one and uh, yeah, we could have looked at yours, I think, Sean, <laughs> when we were actually planning our processes. We, we looked at all the strategies um, around the world and around the states to sort of when we uh, started this process. Um, I want to say, uh, outline why we have uh, the need for strategy, how we went about it, um, what we produced, and I want to go and just finish up on a scorecard because tracking where we're going is really important. So why do we need a sea fishing strategy? Um, well, in, uh, things like participation is fairly high in Tasmania. One in every four um, people go fishing. Um, it's, it's, and, and, and over time there has been effort correct. You know, that I'm going through a process now with, um, we've got many, uh, we've got several depleted species and people say, oh, well, why? How did this happen? We're not increasing too much in the population in Tasmania, but we have got effort creep. There is pressure on our fisheries, um, and that means when there's pre pressure on fisheries, we have to manage um, those, those um, pressures. But um, it's not about all about rules, um, and that's where the strategy comes in. Um, fishers weren't feeling valued. Recreational fishing weren't feeling valued. So over time, commercial, fi commercial fishing has been managed um, and with pressure on resources and things, as we start to manage things, well, people say, well, where do we fit in that equation? And, that's, and by uh, having studies like um, expenditure studies that's been done in the past, like we do a five yearly um, survey of recreational fishers, uh, IMAS do that survey, $160 million were expenditure in that year. Um, we're doing another survey at the moment. Maybe it's double that, you know, or, or something there. We'll, we'll find out this afternoon from uh, the national survey. Um, we've got sort of challenges. Um, Sean, um, sorry, Dave said about the, ho the hotspot. We, in Tasmania, we're in a world climate change hotspot. The, the East Australian current comes down. It's been pushing down further southward each year. Those waters have been remaining um, there longer as they push down. There's some great opportunities um, from that. Um, kingfish um, and the like are, are sort of uh, holding quite well. We've got other species, which like the snapper that Dave said about the breeding as well. But there are some challenges, like uh, we've got the nasty um, um, longspine sea urchin that is gobbling up our forests and things like that. So well done, New South Wales, for that. We'll put you there. Um, yeah, and fishers also want to know where they fit in this equation when you manage fisheries. Um, what is the projections forward? Uh, where are we going to go to? Who's catching what? And all those sorts of things. So there's a need of information. So, so overall, um, a strategic approach was needed. So one of the first things we started the process um, is we wanted to ask people, well, what, what, would they, what do they think about their fisheries and what do they want that fishery to look like in 10 years? So we did this in um, about 2020. So we, we started a, a process. The process started off with the steering group. And that steering group, I think, is the most important part of the process because from the very nature of that composition of the steering group, it was not gov just government. We had the peak body, we had recreational fishers from our, um, our, our rec fac. Um, and a couple of scientists were um, uh, in there as well, and, and some of uh, fisheries managers as well. So from that, we uh, looked at the segmentation of, of um, um, all the participants, um, you know, what the community, we wanted the community involved because, you know, the fishers who fish now are, are, are some of the fishers, people who don't fish now are the fishers of the future or they just want to know that things are being managed well. So they need to be involved. Indigenous fishing, we had tourism operators, councils and the likes and then all the different recreational um, fishing sector. Um, in terms of contact, um, we haven't got a general fishing licence in Tasmania, so actually contacting uh, the, the general audience of recreational fishers is a bit tricky sometimes. We do have licences for uh, abalone, rock lobster, gill netting, uh, and uh, uh, set lines and a couple of others. So what did the process look like? We did a, a stage process. Um, initially, we, we met with um, key stakeholders, framed up some questions, uh, we did a survey. Um, most important in that 
survey, we want to tease out about this vision sort of thing. And I think, Sean, you said the same thing, is that that vision, it's only a, like one sentence, but it actually means so much. And when you get that about right, you actually bring people with you. Um, yeah, so we had a survey monkey um, sort of style um, su um, survey at first. We got, I think, 3,200 submissions through that process. We had small consultative meetings where we just talked to people. Um, and then we drafted up discussion papers and then a draft strategy and then a final strategy. Um, I will say in this process, because you said it uh, also, Sean, about having a, like a figurehead like, to place the importance of this front and centre, um, we had our um, general manager, our d uh, director at the time, um, very, you know, he was out there really pushing us to, to get out there to speak to people. We also had our minister turn up to three meetings, which was quite unusual as well, and he put it front and centre as well. So, um, yeah, 3,200 responses, but w what were they saying? Well, firstly, um, they wanted to tell us how fantastic fishing was, um, but um, the, the things that really came up is they wanted more information, but in a way less information. So why, why I say that is they wanted it presented in a format that they can understand, um, short and sharp, different mediums. Um, so um, that was interesting. I wanted to know more and more about um, how and why fisheries are managed, um, what, how decisions are made, uh, and whether they can have more involvement. Um, the how decisions are based, like the information that goes into them. Uh, they wanted to supply more information, like the information that um, Dave just supplied about citizen science stuff in the fish frame stuff, but also about recording that information. I mean, the success of something like um, the Red Map project, um, which started out by IMS in Tasmania, gave fishers a, a platform where they can say, hey, I found something different here. And so that came through. Um, they wanted their, uh, said they wanted the fisheries to be resilient and stable so that we didn't, you know, they don't like continue, uh, adjustments up and down and things. Um, but then uh, they want things simple, uh, less complex. But then again, if they, if they wanted something like, you know, they told us if we needed a management change or something, um, that it should be well targeted and not broad brush and affect them across the board. So we had some confl uh, conflicting values there as well. We, you know, they want simple legislation, but okay, I only want it applied in this region and you know, all the boundary issues you get from that. The importance of wreck fishing uh, came up. I mean, I think that was the biggest driver. You know, people wanted recreational fishers to be valued because they, they hadn't seen that in the past that we were, um, we'd, where uh, maybe adjustments to the commercial fishing, resource sharing, those things, you know, that, that really came forward that, um, that they wanted to be valued. That, that contribution value uh, or expenditure value, you know, they, they started that, the importance to the community because what they see in their eyes is that um, commercial fishers can actually say, well, we've got a market um, value here, we, we employ people on that, and that's just um, um, not so much out there in recreational fishing. Uh, although this afternoon, we'll, that will certainly be out there when that national survey is released. Um, there was a need, they told us they wanted to minimise their impacts, and also impacts of within sectors as well. In Tasmania, we have um, recreational um, gill netting, we have uh, set lines, long lines, uh, a couple other, couple, couple other methods which um, people uh, who do not use those that gear types or some people who use those gear types think that they uh, may have um, too much impact for recreational fishing. Um, and then we had, um, there was a lot of support for other, other activities. Um, they felt that we were a management agency and that we should be doing more for them. And another big thing that came across too is when they actually go to these things, um, when they ask for things in support activities, they get hit by the typical government type of thing that that's not our business, you'll have to go to the other government department and then just get that run around. So they wanted a bit more coordinated approach to things. And uh, that was a big one for us because um, we, we were very much regulatory. We did, I think we did some really good comms work. But we hadn't touched on things like um, inshore infra infrastructure, fishing platforms, fish cleaning stations and things like that. And then we'd you know, pass them on to another government department and they'd go, well, uh, Mars would, um, Marina Safety Tasmania would say things like, well, we're responsible for boating, not for these fishing support things. 
Ooh. Okay. Um, right. Uh, far away then. Uh, so we come up with a vision there. We we um, we had um, come up with six six different outcomes. Um, as I said, the, the vision we actually like it's like Sean. We got pretty much right. Um, we tweaked around with a couple of words near the end of it. One really important thing about this whole process is is how the 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 um, the the um, strategy is formed and laid. It's got principles. So we can agree on a few principles. So the principles might be, well, we're going to manage fisheries on the best available data. Um, we're going to have resilient fisheries and things, and then you lay it down. So like Sean said, very simple statements, but they're very powerful when you come back a couple of years um, later and you have to do things because you can backtrack. We're not arguing over anything like bag limits in this. You're actually just principles, then, uh, then outcomes. Uh, actions, and I'll just fire through these. Um, we got up there is um, uh, a couple of big ones here is um, uh, identify man management needs um, for ensuring s stock sustainability and things. We're reviewing like gill netting in Tasmania at the moment. That's going to come up in the um, uh, scalefish review that's coming up. Um, things that came up improving education and engagement, we actually liked removed our whole web page for fisheries off the uh, department website and we actually had a lot more freedom to do things and I think our website's really fantastic now. It's, it's very user friendly, it's, it's um, um, yeah, practical and things. Um, compliance came up quite a bit, the need you know, people want to see other people get checked and things and, uh, and the like. Um, sorry, I've got these sort of things here. Um, Involve, yeah, they wanted, uh, people want to be involved much more in community, um, yeah, uh, they want to be involved much more in that decision making process, engaged at early stages, provided that information, so through this strategy we've got a commitment to actually get out there more face to face information because I think like all of us for a little while we went actually this social media route and think well that can do a lot of things for us but it's nothing like um, face to face. Um, Representing fishers come up quite a bit, you know, involving um, public processes, um, the peak body. Um, you know, this this uh, a strategy, good strategy, isn't all about government. So, um, our the peak body in Tasmania's take some of this uh, on board as well. They've been re reviewing some of their their processes, and um, Jane's talk, which was yesterday, which I missed, um, is, is part of that process as well. Um, where are we now? Sorry. Um, valuing, um, yes, I said, um, fishers want to be valued. Um, understanding the value is really important, so this is a driver to actually collect more information to understand about those economic con contributions. Um, promoting the benefits of recreational fishing came out there. Um, make, um, this, uh, another outcome was uh, making it easier to go fishing. Um, one of the th um, key things I'll uh, uh, talk, which is just after this one, is um, Travis Priest about providing fishing facilities. This is something that I think is we can actually have a, a real positive as a department. So it's, we go out and actually say, oh, unfortunately we have to um, manage this fishery. Um, what Sandflat in Tasmania is depleted, but we can actually have some offsets by actually providing, say, um, fish uh, aggregating devices so fishers can go out and actually target other species. So it's given that flexibility here and some other things like um, um, just being a, bit, a little bit more free and acknowledge that sometimes the, what happens on a fishing boat doesn't sort of fit into your legislative environment. Like um, an example would be sharing, uh, sorry, um, using cray pots and things. A pot comes up, you've got a bumper um, catch in one cray pot. Over here you've got zero. The law says it's individual catch, so you have to put those back. And we know in reality that doesn't happen. Yeah, so, okay. Um, a big thing that, that's um, really uh, helped us is uh, improving our capacity, improving the capacity of other um, non-government agencies as well by, by this process. And the important thing is to have an implementation timeline, uh, all the actions sort of out, uh, uh, um, um, listed out, timelines for those, because that then drives the planning processes, it drives budgets, it drives who does what. And it drives our processes within our department, and it's actually allowed us to get great people like like Dave, who's the previous presenter, Kylie, who's pre um, presenting this afternoon, and things to actually improve our um, engagement processes. Um, and um, we're out there at the moment with we did a lot of the without within our department, we we're very reactionary in a lot of our things. 
We've got it on paper. It's in, embedded in paper that we'll have harvest strategies for our key fisheries. So then that drives the government to say, oh, right, you need that support there. And now we've actually got some other staff because of that. Yeah, so, so overall, um, where have we got to? I'll come back here. Yeah, we've, we're, we've got the Gillnet review, as I said before. Um, we've managed to pick up um, $2 million grants for better fishing programs to supporting infrastructure and uh, there's been an audit of um, info, inshore um, infrastructure. We've been reviewing our community engagement programs. And overall, um, I think we're actually on a pathway to a better fishing future. Uh, I'd just like to thank these people in the slide, uh, in particular our general manager, um, Dr Ian Dutton, um, Sven Freilink, who's here, who actually was one of the, uh, Sven was employed for this project and did a great job. Uh, and um, Jane Galishan, who was, who's the CEO of Tarfish as well, was involved in every, every, everyone else. If I could say that the learning sort of things, with a couple of things, I think our process took, took far too long. Um, two years is um, too long. We could have done it in a year. We could have been ahead with other things as well. Um, is this valuable? It's extremely valuable. It's such a simple document but it's driving everything we, we do. Thanks. Thanks, Rod. That's, uh, that's terrific. I love that deep engagement, and it took two years, but you've got ownership, and that's a wonderful thing. Steve, Steve's up next from WA. Yes. Click on my name. Your name. There you go. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Purcell. I'm the program manager for Ozfish in Western Australia. And today I'm going to talk to you about Seeds for Snapper, which is our community-driven seagrass restoration project. Um, and I've actually brought a, a couple of our volunteers along all the way from WA, and, and they're going to help with the presentation today as well. So. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge and pay respect to the, the local Indigenous people where, on the land we stand, but also the, the Noongar Nation where our project is, okay? So Coburn Sound, yes, the CK is silent, um, is just south of Perth, and the traditional name for it is Durbal Nara, which uh, Durbal means waterway or estuary, and Nara is the Australian salmon. Um, so it's a really important um, recreational fishing ground and as you saw in Ingrid's presentation this morning uh, Perth has the highest um, participation rate in Australia for a capital city and a lot of that has to do with the location of Coburn Sound and how important it is to local rec fishers and the broader community as well. So the project name Seeds for Snapper um, comes from seeds, from seagrass, and the snapper, which is pretty iconic, uh, not just in WA, but all, all along the south coast. So Coburn Sound is really important because it's the only known um, spawning site in the, the west coast bioregion, okay? So, um, and the, those stocks support the, the population in the whole um, southwest and south coast, okay? Um, so first up, I'm gonna get Roy up and Roy's going to talk to you from a, a wreck fishing perspective about why Coburn Sound is special and um, why it's important to wreck fishers. Thanks, Roy. Uh, g'day. My name's Roy. Um, I'm just a local bloke who enjoys fishing. Um, I enjoy getting out there and wetting the line like most of us do, getting away from the wife and kids and, and just enjoying yourself. Um, I live in Western Australia, as Steve's already mentioned, and uh, my local fishing area is Coburn Sound. And... Uh, it's, it's a really valuable place to be for me, mainly because it's, it's right on my doorstep and uh, it affords me the chance to go fishing, diving and, uh, and boating. Um, I fished, I've fished in the Sound for many a year and, uh, and over time you can catch, there's many, many different fish you can catch, you know, pink snap, you can catch whiting, flathead, there's a lot of fish. There's, uh, it's very diverse and I can always go out and, uh, you know, <laughs> come home with a feed, it's, it's not so bad at all. Um, recently I've just, uh, I've, I've joined up with the Ozfish team with their Seeds for Snapper and 
And with them, uh, it's given me a different idea of what, what goes on and how we can fish for future and, uh, and the sustainability of it all. And uh, with that, I look forward to spending more time with Ozfish and, uh, and seeing where it takes me uh, on my road, but also fishing for, uh, for the future and the sustainability of it and, uh, and looking forward to you know, continuing going with it. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, Coburn Sound, uh, one of the most important habitats there are the seagrass meadows. It's really important for lots of species, especially the juvenile stages. Um, as we know, seagrass is really important for um, you know, combating climate change. It's capable of um, sequestering you know, up to a lot more than a rainforest, sometimes uh, 30 to some people chuck out the 30 times, 35 times more figure. Um, but sadly, up to 80% of the seagrass in Coburn Sand has been lost. And this is mostly due to historic pollution. Um, Coburn Sand is a bit of an industrial hub. There's an oil refinery, a power plant, a wastewater treatment plant, um, the works. So over the years, the water quality has improved. So now's the time to get out there and start doing this restoration work. So um, the program was really kicked off by University of Western Australia. Okay, we're really, really lucky to work with um, Professor Gary Kendrick, who you can see in the photo there, um, and other people like John Statton, Rachel Austin, who really um, helped to drive the project and, and provide that scientific backing. So um, <clears throat> it started off as a, a trial program, and now it's the biggest um, seagrass restoration project in Australia. Okay. And we think it's pretty special. So it's a three-step process. Um, starts off with collection. Okay, so we're, use, we're targeting the um, Posidonia australis, commonly known as strapweed, ribbonweed, fibreballweed, uh, lots of different names. So we just usually stick with Posidonia australis. Um, it's quite a, a, a different um, species in that it grows all, ar all around the south of Australia, but quite differently in different areas. Okay, so what makes it easy to run this project in Coburn Sound is that it grows quite close to shore, it's all shallow dives, and, it's, and it fruits, okay? Other parts of Australia, um, it, the fruit isn't, isn't as um, big and juicy and not so easy to, to harvest, okay? So when it comes to the fruit, if you leave it to nature, up to about 90% of the fruit will either wash up on the beach, okay? On the west coast, we, we call them um, green bananas. You see them washed up on the beach, the little fruit husks. And um, so what we're doing is we're getting the divers out there to grab a hold of some of that fruit before it ends up on the beach, okay? And how we do that, I've got Janine here to tell you all about that. Janine's one of our volunteer divers, so um, come on down, Janine. Hi there, my name's Janine and I'm a volunteer diver and leader with the Seeds for Snapper project. And um, most of our fruit collection is in the Woodman Point area of Coburn Sound. So for a typical fruit harvest, um, we get together in either dive teams or free dive teams and we head out with our nets. And as Steve said, the majority of our collection is only in about two to three metres of water. So you head out over the meadows looking for areas where there's um, pretty heavy fruit. And so you're just tickling the fruit and, um, and the ripe fruit will just pop off and, and uh, just float up into the top of the net. And so we call this underwater gardening and it's pretty relaxing. And so we're out there with lots of curious toadfish and other you know, curious creatures that are wondering what we're doing in their, in their area. Um, so we do that for about an hour and at the end of an hour you've got a bit of a bounty of fruit there that, you, um, that we take to shore. Uh, at that point it's sorted and counted and um, prepared for the, the tanks where the fruit will then um, just ripen and release the seeds. Um, so I, I, was, um, I was told about the project through a free dive course that I was doing from a really passionate local um, ocean, what would you call Tanya? <laughs> ocean advocate, ocean advocate. And, um, and so wanted to get involved. And 
you know, I mean, any any excuse to get into the water as a diver, and and also I'm really interested in um, looking after our local environment. And as Steve said, you know, finding out that seagrass is 35 times more effective at sequestering carbon than a rainforest, I mean, that that certainly hooked me in. Um, seagrass also uh, traps microplastic in the sediment, and there are so many benefits to seagrass, I've become really passionate about it. Um, and, you know, I tell all of my friends about it as well. I've actually um, been able to, to get other people involved, not just divers. People say, oh, yeah, well, I'm not a diver, I can't be involved. Well, you can come down and you can help us count. You can help us, you know, do things at the tanks. There's lots of things that everybody can do. And, I mean, the appeal is, you know, divers, people who are fishing. It's, it's a really broad appeal. Anybody that enjoys the ocean, really. Um, it's a great project. Uh, one of the biggest benefits, too, from my perspective is because it's such a short fruiting season, if the university weren't including the community, then their impact would be very small. Um, so the year before last, they had a goal of collecting a million fruit. Um, they smashed that goal. Um, last year, with the growth in the community involvement, they actually went for a million seeds, which is like a four fourfold increase. And it's just the, the project just keeps growing and growing and... Yeah, we've, it's it's fantastic. I could talk all day about it, but I won't. Back to you, Steve. Thanks, Okay, so as Janine touched on there, um, once the, the fruit's collected, most of it's from the dive team, but also a little bit from wreck fishers who are out there on their boats scooping it from the surface, a little bit of beach collection as well. But um, the key to it is that the fruit floats, but the seeds sink. So. You put them in these aquaculture tanks for a couple of days, circulating it with fresh seawater to regulate the temperature, and eventually the fruit will just kind of split. Okay, we call it dehissing, and the uh, the seed will sink to the bottom of the tank. The the husk or the, the dead fruit floats on top, and it's um, it's just a matter of then opening up the bottom of the tank, collecting up all the seeds, and we'll, sh we'll show you the dispersal in a second. But um, one of the big challenges we've had in the last couple of years is with our tank system. So the last, last season before this one, 2021, um, we actually lost up to like two thirds of our fruit that we collected. So um, our goal this year was really to improve our efficiencies. And we went and spoke to, we had some new sponsors, Water Corporation, so we're like, hey, you guys got a bunch of engineers on your staff, why don't you um, come and redesign our tank system for us? And they did. Of course, being engineers, they totally over-engineered it, but um, <laughs> we, we got uh, a working system and um, yeah, we had some, had some great results. Um, also, you know, uh, this is Sandy, one of our divers, and she brought her dad down to, as a volunteer too. So um, it's a real, broad range of roles that people can come and do, um, from being on the dive team, we've tried to engage the kayak fishing community to come and help with supervision on kayaks, wreck fishers, retirees, uni students. We had a school group this year which was amazing. These kids um, made their own nets at school, then came down to the beach for a school excursion, with about 50 of them snorkelling around, and they actually collected more fruit than our dive team that day, so it was it was awesome. Yep. Okay. Step three: dispersal, also known as feeding the chooks. So it's a very simple method. Other seagrass restoration projects around Australia and around the world may complicate things a little bit more, but we found that the easiest technique is just to get out there and chuck it out by hand. Okay. Like flinging a frisbee, or as I said, feeding the chooks. Just a nice even throw and the seeds will sink to the bottom and look a bit like, well, we're getting to it, getting ahead of myself now. So when they sink down to the bottom, uh, they'll just settle there and, and start to grow, okay? A lot of those ones are already sprouted, um, but that's fine. And another big part of the dispersal is um, we head down to the local boat ramp and hand out buckets, buckets and buckets full of seeds to local wreck fishers like these guys. And give them a GPS point, a bucket of seeds, and uh, the goal is to head out to the, the marker boy, do a few donuts around the boy while you're chucking out seeds. Super easy, okay?
So we've had some great results. Um, again, this is all thanks to the work done by University of Western Australia, um, Gary Kendrick and his team. But compared to uh, naturally seeded control sites in the adjacent areas, we're getting results like something like 2,000% increase in um, seedlings. So yeah, pretty cool. Um, some of our stats from last year, we ended up putting out more than 1.2 million seeds. And we actually had to call the season off a bit early because we'd, we'd gone over our quota. And um, yeah, it was really amazing to see. And 100% community driven, okay? Um, we'd be nowhere without the volunteers here. So we did, um, yep, over two hectares seeded over five sites. And um, our impact last year was, was more than the whole history of the project. So yeah, pretty cool. Over 2,500 2, volunteer hours too, from, as we said, divers to shore-based volunteers to, to wreck fishers. What now? Um, so as we saw there, you know, we've, we've restored two hect over two hectares, but the amount that's been lost in Coburn Sound is in the, the hundreds of hectares. So now we're really looking to scale things up, more funding, more tanks, more pumps, more volunteers, and um, we'll just keep pushing until we're, we're hitting the multiple millions, I think. Um, but yeah, it's not, out, not without its challenges. Uh, running those pumps every day, you know, Dom's in the crowd there, put your hand up, Dom. Dominic down there nearly every morning, priming the pumps, um, trying to run those pumps in a, a wavy environment next to a, a dredging facility, not ideal, but we got it done. Uh, Ozfish is also leading the way across Australia with different seagrass projects, okay? So if you are in any of those areas, grab someone with a blue shirt. If they don't know what, what's happening, they can definitely point you in the right direction. So um, again, thanks to uh, our su supporters, um, WA Government, the RFIF, the Recreational Fishing Initiative Fund, been our biggest supporter, uh, Wreckfish Wests, also great to see them here this week, and there we go. So um, another cool thing that we did this year was we we actually went and seeded uh, an artificial reef, um, which if you saw uh, James's presentation yesterday from Wreckfish West, we've got some great reefs in WA, and uh, the city of Coburn just built an anti-erosion reef. So we went and dropped uh, 225,000 seagrass seeds on there to uh, assist with their anti-erosion programs, so, yep, that's about it. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> um, if you don't mind, there's a quick video there that you can watch while we do questions or something like that. Steve, that was fantastic. What a great way to finish our session. Uh, really positive outcome. Decent, proper engagement, ownership, brilliant outcome. Love to see you go further. And Ozfish really deserve a pat on the back. You guys are fantastic. So well done. We've got time for a couple of quick questions. To any of the speakers that gave talk uh, today, anyone got any burning questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Steve. Um, sorry, mate, I missed the beginning of your talk and you might have mentioned it, but um, have the threats that originally led to the demise of the seagrass been addressed in, in, the, in, in the system um, or are they still still present? And if so, what, what risks do they pose to your efforts? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so uh, the, the seagrass was lost to industrial pollution, really, um, and a lot of those threats have decreased or improved um, but if you talk to anyone from WA they'll tell you that there's there's a pretty big threat coming to the area as well in the form of the uh, a new port okay so um, yeah we do we do get a few questions about you know are you doing this whether they're, they're going to build Westport and things like that of course not but um, yeah we just always answer that we're trying to do something positive there's lots of um, opinions out there about what how it should be managed and things like that, but we're, we're just doing something positive, and that's, that's where we come from. Any other questions? 
Um, yeah, and thanks to everybody for their um, um, time and still in disseminating um, really good information. My question really goes to, I think Tyson said something about agency um, trust and, uh, and then getting on to Sean's about um, uh, public consultation. Uh, I think there's a lot of people in the room that have been in, involved in public consultation and sometimes we're convinced that it's just um, uh, window dressing and, and, and not genuine. So to you, Sean, what would you say if I had written to your public consult, into your consult, consultation, how would you tell me that it's been considered properly? Um, great question. Can I get you to jump behind the uh, sure. yep, podium? It'd be great. Yeah. Um, we, we, we had the benefit of, of this one. It, it, you know, the, at the policy level, it's not really uh, regulatory. Um, it's driving programs and, and, and uh, on engagement, on uh, uh, science, on, uh, on, um, on certain management activities. If you had, if you had that comment, um, you could A, contact us, but what you'd end up seeing is the end product. It's unfortunately very high level, but you would see something in the implementation plans. It, this was rather unique for me, and given my kind of history with regulations and stuff like that, in that um, almost all the comments were very positive. And I think I had that one slide that, you know, said that, it, you know, most of it was just more. People wanted more. I mean, uh, uh, really, out of all the letters that we got, the one kind of negative, you know, don't do this, um, came from the one state that, that, uh, um, wrote to us and, and they just said, you know, make sure that you don't cross over into uh, state management and, and, and things like that. And we, we already work with them and we acknowledged and already had a meeting with their letter saying this is what we plan to do. They were fine with it. Um, most of it was a pitch that, you know, we don't need you to go do this research. Give us the money. Uh, we'll go do that research for you. I mean, so that was the really only the negative part. I, I think you, you know, if you wrote to me, uh, wrote to us during this process, you would see, you would see it in there. Um, we, we, we wove it into all of this, uh, all this stuff. But again, it's pretty high level. So, um, if you did write about uh, your local boat ramp in South Carolina or something like that, um, then you probably wouldn't see it. But you would see um, implement stra implementation strategies um, promoting access. Does that answer kind of? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, lunch is waiting, but we can keep going in a few minutes. We can hold off 100 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm from the European Anglers Alliance. I've got a question for Tyson. Um, and it, the question is uh, in my experience, for catch reporting uh, to have a chance of becoming a social norm, wreck fishers have got to see some positive policy outcome from it at some stage. Uh, so I was wondering if you could give any examples of where that's happened and there's been a positive policy outcome for recreational fishing, which then encourages uh, catch reporting uh, in the future. Uh, I can't, off the top of my head, give any examples of the policy outcome side of things, but from what I can see in my behaviour research sort of so far is that you're exactly right. There's got to be some either... Uh, benefit to it, they have to see an advantage in them providing that data. So whether that's an advantage because they can share a catch log on social media and brag to their mates about how, how good they were at fishing that day or whether that's an advantage uh, or whether that's um, that we provide tips and tricks on how to catch those fish or a log of the moon phases when they're catching those fish. Um, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's two ways to approach it. You either have to encourage them to try and help address the problem and make sure that they believe deep down that providing your catch is the right thing to do or they have to see that they're getting something out of it at the other end. So um, I don't know of any examples off the top of my head but I completely agree and that's um, something I'm trying to work at. We've got a workshop up in Queensland next week actually on um, so things like gamification of recreational fishing apps. So they sort of trying to inspire participation by making it more fun to use and things like that. Are there biases associated with doing that that we can adjust for later on that will get us more participation? So, yeah, I'm sorry I can't provide any examples off the top of my head, but it's definitely an issue that 
um, that I'd like to try and uh, improve in that space so that they are getting benefits out of it. So. Any more questions? Thank you very much.